Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mission Valley Community Chapel on this, the last Sunday of January. We'd like to begin by preparing our hearts in silent prayer before the Lord. thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are our salvation. We thank you that you have, that we can put our faith in your strength, Father, and lean upon that. We just ask that you bless this meeting today. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight today, Lord. In your name, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, we can stand and we can turn to our first hymn, number 81, number 81.
Well, good morning. Good to see Lydia here. Lydia, when, when is it? February, what is your surgery? 15. 15th? Right after Valentine's Day. <coughs> happy birthday. Yeah. For happy, yeah. happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, let's bring Lydia chocolates. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, well, um, we've got a lot of prayer requests. I know uh, Jean fell last night and cracked, fractured four ribs. Yeah, so, yeah, not broken, they're not separated, but she fractured four. She's not very happy um, being there. Jean's pretty independent and dependent on the Lord. But uh, anyway, um, they're going to try to put her in a rehab um, at some point here, right? And so that's what uh, Don Ailes is doing right now. So let's pray for them. Let's pray for the place for her and all that to work well. Um, and then also Maggie, du Maggie Dwyer is is going to go in for surgery. It's been a long wait for Maggie's heart surgery scheduled for 1st of February, unless he gets moved earlier. And the intent is to repair or replace the mitral valve via robotic surgery. So that's a pretty, pretty interesting thing. So <clears throat> let's pay, pray for that. Is, where is she going to be? Do you know? They live uh, up in Oceanside area. And okay. we just saw her husband a few weeks ago on the video uh, for OM. Yeah. And he was over in... Europe at the time, uh, or at least that video was. But so she's here she's doing it? Yeah, they're here right now, so I'm not sure where she's having it done. Okay. Well, we've got plenty of requests. Our government, persecuted brethren around the world, our sick, Margie, Myrna, Betsy, Dan, Ed, Lydia, Rachel, Diane, Roberta, Mike, Jolie, and Tom. Uh, recovery, let's pray for continue to pray for Sterling. He's in a uh, rehab place now. Do you, do you know any kind of dates? Or? No, they're just working on him trying to stand up by himself, trying to walk. Um, he was incapacitated and dysfunctional for so long. Yeah. He was having to just start all over. But he is eating solid food for the first time. Good. I love it. Well, okay, and then the upcoming uh, surgery, of course, is Maggie and Lydia. Let's pray for that. Lydia, the 215. And Vanessa's dad is in hospice, right? And said, well, it's his birthday today, right? Uh, yeah. Happy birthday. And then um, Dawn's sister, Susie, I don't know if everybody heard, last Tuesday she passed away. So Don and Cookie will be leaving Thursday to Texas, have a, have a service there. They'll be back Sunday, and then I guess they'll do another one here. So let's pray for the college students, unsaved loved ones, the broadcast, the outreaches from the chapels, Thomas Orob's broadcast, CEF Good News Clubs, Real Life Ministries, Mobile Dental Van, and Whitefields National Pastors. Does uh, anybody have anything else? Okay. Oh, well, birthday. Yeah, speaking of birthday, well, what's the date today? Tomorrow's the 30th. Yeah. That's your birthday. <laughs> and yesterday was Carson's birthday. So let's sing happy birthday. Judy, can you play for you? <laughs>
Okay, is that it? Thanks, guys. Alrighty, if we could stand and turn to number 368. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, number 368. <laughs>
uh, so many different um, physical and other ailments. Uh, Lord, we don't, um, not embarrassed to say we're a needy people. Lord, we need you. Uh, we need your comforting hand. We need your guiding hand. Um, and Lord, we do thank you, God, for your, uh, uh, most importantly, your uh, salvation that comes through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we do pray. I pray for everybody here that we would be knowing um, the peace that comes from knowing God, being a friend of God. And so, Lord, we do pray for those uh, who um, aren't knowing that. Lord, may we be those who would uh, introduce uh, our Lord Jesus to these other needy individuals. Um, Lord, we just want to lift all these things up to you. Um, trust that, Lord, you will answer according to your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All these seated, and we will have our special music. Are we doing the missionary moment after or before? Oh, right. It will be a missionary moment. Okay. So you want to turn on that projector, and I'll put the screen down. <sighs> okay. So we're going to be hearing from. Dan Sered, uh, he and his wife Dina are with Jews for Jesus. All right, let's so me watch this. Shalom, everybody at Mission Valley Community Chapel. And my name is Dan Sered, together with my wife Dina, and we serve with Jews for Jesus. Jews for Jesus is a ministry that's committed to reaching Jewish people with the gospel. Most Jewish people around the globe are unreached today for Messiah Jesus. They don't know the Lord. Most Jewish people are either atheists or agnostic, secular Jews. And there's also Orthodox Jewish community. They make only about 10% of the entire Jewish population and on earth. And again, they are unreached. Jewish people are unreached with the gospel. Less than 1% of Jewish people know the Lord. And, and that's what our, our ministry, Jews for Jesus, is all about. We're all about sharing the gospel with Jewish people. Jews for Jesus is an international mission. And our largest branch today is in Israel. And Israel has about 8 million Jewish people, but only about 8,000 Jewish people who believe in Jesus. That's how unreached the Jewish population in Israel is. Jews for Jesus, we're committed to bringing the gospel, to making Jewish disciples for Jesus. And we do it through different methods, through different ways. And we go and tell Jewish people about Messiah Jesus. We invite Jewish people to come and see, to come and see what it means to be Jewish and to believe in Jesus. We create events where, um, where, where, where they attract Jewish people to come and then we engage them with the gospel. And then our last pillar of ministry is what we call love and serve, where we go out and where we and serve Jewish people and so bringing the gospel not only with our words but also with and um, with actions and so and both Dina and I we serve and um, just outside of New York City in New Jersey I have the privilege of being the chief operating officer for the ministry of Jews for Jesus I'm responsible for all of our ministry um, worldwide outside of North America as you know, um, there's been um, a lot of tension um, in Ukraine where Russia invaded the Ukraine and, and a big, um, a, a lot of our ministry as of late has been to minister to the Ukrainian refugees, to the, to the Ukrainian Jewish population, and most of which have now left Ukraine as refugees. 
Before the war, we had about 22 staff in Ukraine, both in Kiev and Odessa. And many of our staff and now have relocated with those refugees, both in Germany and Hungary and Israel as well. But we also have some staff who are still in Ukraine um, serving. Svetlana was born in 1933 in Kharkov, a city right on the border and between Ukraine and Russia. Kharkov is a city in Ukraine. And in 1941, when she was eight years old, the Nazi army, the German Nazi army, was right there on the footstep of her city. And um, as a result of that, her family um, had to escape the city. And uh, miraculously, um, she and her family survived. They survived the Holocaust. And after the war, after World War II, they went back to the city where um, she grew up. She basically, um, you know, finished schooling, got married, established a home and a family in Kharkov. <clears throat> How tragic that about two and a half months ago, three months ago, and once again Svetlana had to leave her city, this time as an 89-year-old, and um, she had to flee because once again um, a foreign army was overtaking her city. And as she escaped, um, Svetlana ended up in a, in a church um, just outside of Kiev, where providentially the leader of Jews for Jesus, Kiev, Tolik, who was ministering, and he got to meet Svetlana, and uh, he understood from her that she was wanting to flee Ukraine. So he took her, and um, as part of our ministry, he took her, driving her down to the Polish border. And on the way, he was able to share the gospel with Svetlana, and praise God, she committed her life to the Lord. Once they reached the Polish border, and she crossed the border into Poland, and the Jews for Jesus ministry team was there, ready to welcome her and to care for her, providing for food and shelter and medicine, and also assisting her as she decided to move to Israel. And I'm glad to report that Svetlana now lives in, in the northern city in Israel, a city called Akko, where she's still being ministered to and being discipled by our staff and by our team. And I share with you the story to say that that's really what our ministry, Jews for Jesus, is all about. We're all about making disciples. And I'm so grateful for your partnership with our ministry today. So thank you so much for your prayers and your partnership. We really, we really, we can't do, we can't bring the gospel to Jewish people without you and what you're doing for the Lord. So thank you so much and God bless you. to you, you are going to be a part of the special music too. So um, I'd like you to open to 807 and I would like to invite you to participate with me, help me out on the chorus. Uh, Claudia and I will be singing in Portuguese two stanzas and then we'll, you'll join, we'll join in together um, in English, the chorus, and then we'll sing the next two stanzas in Portuguese, and we'll end there. In November, you know, I went back uh, to, to Brazil because we were in, a, a, Claudia and I had the responsibility of a three-day children's conference, mission conference, and it was our third year in a row to do this, but the theme that we chose was Mission Possible. Yeah. And each little kid had their little kit. Aww. And um, in here, our, our story was on Corrie ten Boom. 
And um, we have little things of de uh, the little detectives and, and all, but each one had a kit here. And it says Mission Impossible possible, uh, with the verse Luke 18, 27. It says Jesus responded, um, what is impossible for man is possible for God. It's only possible because of our course says, all power give, is given unto me, all power is given unto me. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel, and lo, I am with you always. And that's why we can go like this missionary, reaching the Jews everywhere, because missions is possible. If we are willing to grab on God's power and go forward. Jesus, millones que en trevas tão medonhas, já sem perdido, sem o Salvador. Quem, quem irá? As novas proclamando que Deus em Cristo salva o pecador. Portas abertas, eis por todo o mundo, crentes em Cristo. Avançai e sem temor, unidas vossas forças, da escravidão os povos libertai. Oh, power is given unto me. Oh, power is given unto me. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel of Divina chama, vim te clamar em nome de Jesus, para nos salvar da maldição eterna, seu sangue derramou por nós na cruz. Ó oh, Deus, apressa o dia glorioso em que os remidos todos se unirão. Em coro excelso, santo jubiloso, por todo sempre glória te darão. Oh, power is given unto me. Oh, power is given unto me. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel and love. If you could please open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 20, and we are going to focus on verses 41 through 44. Luke chapter 20, verses 41 through 44. Um, before I read the scripture, uh, we know that the testimony of the whole Bible and the testimony of the true church of God throughout church history has always been that Jesus Christ is the Lord God incarnate, the only Savior of mankind from their sins and from the wrath of God upon us because of our sin. And this issue is that what we see in these verses, Luke 20, 41 through 44. So let's hear the word of God. And he said to them, the Lord Jesus, to the Jewish religious leader, How can they say that Christ is the son of David? Now David himself said in the book of Psalms, referring to Psalm 110, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. 
Therefore, David calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time of worship here at your church. Thank you for uh, being able to praise you, worship you in a spirit and truth, in safety. Thank you for the ability to do that, for your love and your grace that has brought us here. And may you now open the word for us to get a deeper understanding of the person uh, and the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may we praise him and share the good news of him with more and more people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. When we come to these uh, verses, uh, as far as chronology is concerned, uh, at the time, uh, we are in late, uh, in Tuesday afternoon, on the last week of the Lord's life on earth, uh, the Holy Week, the late Tuesday. He will be crucified on Friday and risen on Sunday morning. It was on Sunday before that he made his entry into Jerusalem to the Hosanna of the massive multitude of people. And on this Tuesday, he has spent the entire day in and around the temple area teaching the large crowds and being confronted by religious leaders. They have done everything they can on, they can on this day to publicly discredit him, but they failed. The Pharisees have made their effort, then the Herodian have made their effort, then the Sadducees have made their efforts, and they all failed. All of them were unsuccessful. All of them exposed by the wisdom and the clarity and the power of our Lord's response that all their arguments are foolish. Luke says in verse 40, then the, after all these confrontations, they didn't have courage to question him any longer about anything. Now it is his turn, now it is Jesus' turn to ask them questions. And in verse 41 we read this, And he said to them, How is it that they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalm, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David therefore calls him Lord. How is he his son? And you know, uh, no Middle Eastern father in the Middle Eastern culture, no Middle Eastern father would ever, ever, under any situation, call his son Lord. And yet David's son is, uh, is being called here as they also as David's Lord. The nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, the essential nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, has been debated since he was on earth to our time, to this day. And it will be debated throughout all of human history until he comes and, and then there will be end of any debate. And it comes down to this, was Jesus God or is he merely a man? And throughout history, the Lordship of Christ his deity has always been attacked. The general consensus in the world is that Jesus was a man, lived and died as a noble man, insightful, wise, devout, compassionate, and whatever other adjective you would like to fit in there. But he was only a man. Only a man. And that's consistent, of course, with Satan's agenda, because if Jesus is merely a man, then he's not God, and he is not the Savior. The Bible is not true. Christianity is not genuine, is not true. It's a false religion. However, if on the other hand, if Jesus is God, then he is the sovereign Lord, he is in charge, the Bible is true, and Christianity is genuine, and therefore this is the critical issue. Was Jesus a mere man or God incarnate? Because it is so fundamental to salvation, to biblical truth regarding the person of Christ, that uh, uh, his true nature, uh, the, true, the, the true Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Christ that the Bible presents to us, is rejected 
by all the satanic cults and all the false, false religions of our world. For example, the Mormons believe that Jesus Christ is the older spirit brother of Satan and just the created spirit, the created being. Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus was Michael the Archangel before his birth and after his birth he lived a perfect he lived as a perfect man like uh, Adam before his fall and died and resurrected as a spirit being uh, and is still just a created uh, being. Islam teaches that he was a human prophet who taught Islamic truth. Baha'i, the Baha'i religion, teaches that he is one of many manifestations of God. And always remember this, Jesus is not a manifestation of God. Jesus is God manifested. There's a big difference between these two. Hindus believe that he was a guru. And to the Buddhists, he is an enlightened teacher, and on and on and on we can uh, continue. There are also those uh, apostate Christian, liberal Christian, who call themselves Christian, but they deny that Jesus is God, but that's not any Christianity. Uh, the Jewish people today and throughout history and at the time of Jesus did not acknowledge him as God except for a minority of Jewish believers as we saw in that uh, missionary presentation. They didn't acknowledge him as Jehovah incarnate, they didn't acknowledge him as God, the second member of Trinity. Now pay attention, in fact, they didn't believe that the Messiah would be God. They believed that Messiah was to be merely a man and no more than that. A noble man, a powerful man, influential man, a man endowed by God, endowed by the power of God, greater than any other man, but still only a man. And in the Jewish thinking, the Messiah was to be human and only a human. He was to be a human who would come into the world, would become the ruler of Israel, reestablish the kingdom of Israel, subjects all Israel enemies and rules the world of nations from Jerusalem and would bring to fulfillment all God's promises to Abraham and to David. They did not see Messiah as God or the Son of God or the Savior of sinners. They saw him only as a man, as a great leader. When Jesus claimed to be God, he became immediately a blasphemer in the eyes of people and their religious leader. In addition to that, he then began a fiery assault on their theology, on their power, on their position, influence, and on their false sense of righteousness, and even on their temple operation. And that was at the very beginning of his ministry, and it occurred all throughout his ministry, and again at the end, even in this last week of his life on earth, he cleanses the temple, confronts their corruption, exposes their hypocrisy, and all these escalate their feverish desire to get rid of him, to kill him. So they tried this week, the Holy Week, to confront him unsuccessfully. They tried three times and they failed all, the three, all those three times. And finally, as we read in verse 40, their mouth were shut. It is not his time to ask questions. This is his last time to engage the religious leader of Israel. It is his time, it is his last conversation. What might you imagine the conversation would be? Well, you would assume that if his conversation with them is the last one, he's going to discuss what's the most important matter, and that is the matter of salvation. And he does that. He asks them this question, verse 41. He said to them, how is it that they say the Christ is David's son? You know, that's a very... Um, insightful question. This is a discerning question. It, it gets right to the core of the matter. How is it that they say Messiah is David's son? Uh, now, 
Just a reminder, Matthew has an account of this question by Jesus. Mark also has this account of this question by Jesus. And Matthew and Mark account enriches this one in Luke. So we see so often uh, the same situation in other, other parts of the gospel, in this, especially the synoptic gospel. They complement each other. And if we go to the Matthew and Mark, we get few things that kind of help us to understand what's going on here in Luke. The first one is to ask the question, why is Jesus bringing this issue up in the first place? Uh, isn't he aware at this point that they have fully rejected him? What's the point of going back to clarify who he is again? What's the point of that? And, and you find the answer. The answers come from Mark chapter 12, verse 34. He knew of some who were not far from the kingdom of God. He knew of some who were not far from the kingdom of God. He knew of some Jewish leader who were not far from coming to faith and salvation. That would include, for example, one of the leaders by the name of, by the name of Joseph from Aram, uh, Aramitia, who you meet later in Luke as the one who provides a tomb for the Lord. This then, believe it or not, is the final evangelistic effort by the Lord Jesus to save some from among those Jewish leaders. Even after all the hatred they expressed toward Jesus, in spite of all of that, uh, he, Jesus still is a compassionate evangelist. He has compassion upon those people. He's still down to the very last conver uh, conversation, inviting sinners headed to hell to know him for who he truly is, to seize their open rejection, to seize their indecision and come to faith in him. He still manifests enough concern to speak one more time the truth, for he is God incarnate. He is the only Savior, and God has no pleasure uh, in the death of the wicked. His joy is in the salvation of sinners. That's what is in the Lord Jesus' heart at this time. If you go back to Luke 19, verse 41, when he first approached Jerusalem at the, that triumphal entry on that Sunday, a couple of days earlier, he saw that city and wept over it. He's a weeping savior. He's a compassionate savior. And so one more time, he calls them to the truth about himself. And this, dear friend, is absolutely <coughs> essential for salvation because no one will go to heaven who does not believe Jesus is God. No one. This is the clear, unmistakable, unambiguous testimony of the scripture. Jesus is God incarnate. In John 3, uh, 36, John the Baptist testified that he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see the life, but the wrath of God abides on him. He who believes Jesus is the Son of God, therefore believes in divinity of Christ, he has life. In 1 John 2, verse 22, uh, first letter of John, chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Who is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the, the, the Son does not have the Father. Whoever denies the Sonship of Christ, the deity of Christ. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. You have no relationship with God the Father unless you confess the truth about the Son. That He is God incarnate. He is the only Savior of the world and believe in Him. So once more, the Lord Jesus affirms and asserts his divine nature as God, and he does offer himself even to those who hated him, despised him as their savior. Even in this last days of his life on earth, he wants to uh, reach out and save some of them. 
And Jesus here gives an invitation to them once more to consider who he is and to receive the blessing that he will uh, willingly give to any repentant sinner. And so the Lord asked them this discerning question. But you need to go to Matthew, and uh, in Matthew 22, verse 41, this is where the conversation really starts, uh, in Matthew 22, 41. Here's what Jesus said first, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, literally one word, David's. And that's exactly what he expected them to say. Uh, what do you think about Christ? What is your view of Messiah? Let's talk about the nature of Messiah. Let's talk about the essence of Messiah. Whose son is he? What nature does he bear? And they responded immediately with a conventional Jewish answer. He is David's son. He's David's. Now, you come to Luke and you read that Jesus said, How is that they say that Christ is David's son? How did you come to that conclusion? He questioned their common answer farther. They believed the Messiah would be merely a man, but the best of men, noblest of men, the most gifted and blessed man is the son of David. So you have this very direct and very essential and important question placed before them. As I said, it's an insightful, discerning question because it discerns to the core where a person is spiritually. And, but the answer is incomplete. The answer that they give is deficient, a deficient answer. Their answer was David's son. As I read to you from Matthew chapter 22. Was that true? Yes, of course. Second Samuel chapter 7 Verses 12 through 14 prophesy, prophesies clearly that the Messiah would come out of the line of David. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 14. Or read Psalm 89. You will find it there five, six times. Messiah will come from the line, loins of David. Amos 9, 11, Micah 5, 2, and lots of other verses. So, yes, of course. Uh, the Messiah is going to be from David's line. This was a common belief in Jesus' day. When he entered to the city, the pe people were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Matthew 21, 9. Uh, they were referring to him as the Messiah. So everybody understood that. Luke 18, 38 and 39 also refers to the blind men in Jericho who called upon Jesus saying, Have mercy upon us. Son of David, they confess their faith in him as the Messiah. It is true that he was in the Davidic line. The genealogy of Matthew 1 establishes that he is in Davidic line. The genealogy of Luke chapter 3 establishes that, that he is in Davidic line. His father Joseph was in the Davidic line. His mother Mary was in the Davidic line. Both line converts, of course, in him by blood through his mother and by right through his father, even though his father was not his father in terms of actual physical human birth. But nevertheless, he is the son of David. And by the way, you know, this is very important, pay attention to that. If he was not in the line of David, if he was not the son of David, it would have been waved, it would have been thrown at him to his face immediately by the religious leaders, by the scribes and the Pharisees and Sadducees, because these people kept a very, very careful records of genealogy of all people, which were, which were destroyed in AD 70 by the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem by the Roman army. Uh, and that was a great loss to the Jewish people. If Jesus was not, in fact, the son of David, his enemies, they would have discovered that immediately in the temple gene genealogical records, and they would discredit him on the spot publicly. You are not from the line of David. But they knew that he is. The scribes kept those records with great, great care 
preserving things in the right tribe, in the right families, in the right heritage for the future great glorious kingdom to come. It could be easily checked, and I believe, I assure you, they checked it on Jesus, and I'm sure they knew in fact that he was the son of David. He was from that line. So the answer is correct, but it is incomplete. It is deficient answer. So you go from a very discerning question to a deficient answer to then what I call it a divine reality. A divine reality. And this is marvelous. This again shows us so much. In verse 42 the question is, how is it that they say Christ is David's son? How can you say that when David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, set at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And David therefore calls him Lord, Adonai. And how is he his son? And this is just amazing. Uh, let me tell you what Jesus is doing here in this argument. Uh, why are you, he's saying, why are you calling Messiah David's son? And only David's son. When David himself said in Psalm 110 verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, Jehovah said to Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, let me tell you the foundation of our Lord's argument. Everybody, everybody knew Psalm 110 was a messianic psalm. Everybody. The standard universal Jewish interpretation of Psalm 110 is, it is speaking of the coming Messiah. This coming Messiah is the one who will sit at the right hand of God, the position of power and authority, and make all Israel's and thus God's enemy uh, a footstool for his feet. He's a conquering hero. How then, if this is messianic, and Messiah is to be David's son, how is it that David calls him Lord, Adonai, one of the names of God in the Old Testament? Because verse 1 begins in Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, Jehovah is talking to the Messiah, and David said, the Messiah is my Lord. How can Messiah be David's son and David's Lord? There is only one way, there is only one answer. He has to be eternal God who becomes a man. He has to be everlasting God who takes a flesh, who becomes in time a man. The Messiah is both man and God. He is the eternal Son of God as well as a man, Son of David. He is David's Son and David's Lord. If he was just a descendant of David to come centuries later, how could David in the present tense refer to him as my Lord, my Adonai? Well, you know, some liberals came along and said, oh, David was wrong when he said this. And it was just a mistake, a crazy moment for David. He was wrong. However, go to Matthew 22, verse 43, and listen to this. It says, David said that in the spirit. Or go to Mark chapter 12, verse 36. It says, David said that, said that, that uh, kind of testimony, in the Holy Spirit. So David said it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This, is, this argument is a very powerful argument for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his deity. When verse 44 sums it, uh, sums it up, David therefore calls him Lord, and then Jesus has asked, how is he only his son? You have an impossible dilemma. Matthew says after this incident, no one, no one dared, no one is able to answer him a word. Nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him any question. They realized that they cannot handle him. Uh, they, they realized that he was able to handle all of their questions, but they couldn't handle even one of his questions. 
you could talk about the deity of Jesus Christ in so many ways. He manifested the attributes of God, omnipotence, uh, commanded the elements, commanded the demons, commanded the physical war, commanded death, life, forgave sin. He has the attribute of omnipresence. He was able to be everywhere at all times if he desired to be. He was omniscient. He knew everything, including the thoughts of man. He was immutable. He never changed. He was holy, true, wise, sovereign, loving, eternal, glorious, unchanging, and on and on. So he's God. He's God in the same way that God, God the Father is God, and nothing less than that. And if God became a man, let's just create a hypothesis. If God became a man, what, we, what would we expect of him to be like? Well, I think, first of all, we would expect him to be sinless. Because God, the true God, the God of the scripture is holy, holy, holy. So if God became a man, he would be sinless. Was Jesus sinless? Yes. Even his own enemies couldn't find any accusation against him, any sin against him. He was holy, harmless, undefined, separated from sin. In John chapter 8, 46, uh, he brings a challenge. He asks a question that has remained unanswered to this day. Which one of you convict me of a sin? Which one of you convict me of a sin? And his worst enemy could not make any reply to his challenge. If God were a man, we would expect not only there, that uh, there would be no sin, the absence of sin, but we would accept also, secondly, the presence of perfect righteousness. He would be the purest person who ever lived, and Jesus was that person. If God were a man, we would expect, him, we would expect his words to be the greatest words ever spoken because he has the greatest intelligence and greatest wisdom and the greatest command of the truth and the greatest command of the expression of the truth. And the word of Jesus was like that. No one ever spoken any words at any time, at any place like Jesus. And it was said of him in John chapter 7, verse 46, when the religious leaders sent the temple guards to arrest him, and those guys went and came back empty-handed and asked him, well, what happened? Why didn't you bring him back? They said, never a man has spoken the way this man speaks. These guys, the temple guard, were just amazed by the words of Jesus. If God became a man, we would expect him to display supernatural power, with ease because it would be a true reflection of his nature and Jesus did that controlled nature healed people walked on the water raised the dead dominated the kingdom of the demons and on and on literally did he did miracles in numbers in such a way that could not be counted and John and his gospel by saying that there are too many miracles that he did that you can't even write them. Uh, I mean, they won't quit. There is not enough books to write about all the miracles of Jesus. If God were a man, we would expect him to exert profound influence on humanity. And Jesus did that like no other person in all human history. He changed the world. He divided the history. We have B.C. and A.D. Even the secular, non-believing world must use the word A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. <laughs> so whenever they use the, uh, 2023 uh, or any date like that, they are confessing the Lordship of Jesus. If God were a man, we would expect him to manifest the love of God, the grace of God, kindness, compassion of God, and Jesus does all of them. We would expect him to display justice of God, the judgment of God, the wrath of God, and he does. And if you read the Old Testament and get the picture of God there, then read the New Testament, Christ is the perfect representation of God in human form, as book of Hebrews chapter 1 tells us. The people of his time wouldn't believe it, no matter what he did. 
they wouldn't believe it because they didn't want to believe it. Uh, look at Luke 22, Luke 22, verse 66. Uh, this is after they arrested him, verse 66. When it was day, the council of elders of the people, the leaders assembled, chief priests, scribes, they led him away to the council chamber and say, now listen to this, if you are the Christ, just tell us. And I, my answer, are you kidding me? I mean, he said that so many times in so many different ways. If you are Christ, tell us. But he said, said that to them. If I, and he, that's why he responds is this, if I tell you, you will not believe. What's the point? I'm not going to waste my time anymore. I, did, I gave you guys enough opportunity. And if I ask you a question, you will never answer me. Uh, do you know, they, you know, they never denied his miracles. None of them. They never denied his wisdom. They never refuted his exposition of the scripture. They never discredited the answer he gave to their question. They just didn't want to believe. And that's a sad error of people throughout history, even in our time. But let me end by making it a little bit more personal. What about us? Are we with these hard-hearted, stone-cold leaders who see it all and yet don't see it? Who never deny any of it, but they will not believe it, they will not commit themselves to him? Or are we with the crowd that is uh, indecisive? Uh, they can be led around by nose and one day they cry Hosanna and then in a few days later they cry crucify him. What is our response? What is your response to the question, whose son is Jesus Christ? If he is the son of God, then he is truly the Messiah, the Lord, the only Savior, and the only way by which a sinner through faith alone can escape hell and enter to heaven. Have you put your faith in him? Let's pray. Father God, we see again, as we always do, the wondrous beauty, majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ in your word. And Lord, this is given to us uh, today by you as a call, a call to believe. Father, I pray that there will be no heart here turn away. Uh, but all will embrace the Savior and believe, repent, and receive the gift of eternal life. If you haven't given your life to the Lord, do it now. And it is in His name we pray and ask all this. In Jesus' name, Amen.
thank you, Father, that you have given us your word to study, to learn, that we may better believe. We thank you, Father, that your authority is sure and that you have given us you have given us the, the, the word, Father, as presented by Sora through the Bible, Lord, that we can verify who you are, that we may better trust in you and lean on you for our strength. We ask that you bless the rest of this day and in your name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Oh, no.